Welcome to the CBS Eye on Money show. It's Tuesday, December 20th. This is the crunch week for a lot of you. You probably didn't you probably didn't get your stuff done in time. I know. It's all right. The pressure's off now that we know that many of these supply chain issues are relieved this year. I know that there are some folks who just have so much other stuff going on that it makes more sense to just, let's just wait till the end. It'll be fine. It'll get taken care of. And it usually is fine. And it usually does get taken care of. So don't stress. Don't stress. Mark, if you're um, looking for a last minute kind of thing, what do you usually do? Do you just click on anything or do you go out and actually go into a store? Highly unlikely that's happening. More more likely I am uh, on the laptop clicking away. And do you think that there is any benefit to waiting later? Will there be things that come on sale this week? Because maybe maybe some of these stores just ordered too much stuff this year. Maybe they, they caught them by surprise how the economy has uh, maybe slowed down a little bit. So you think there's a bargain to be had? I'm sure there are bargains to be had, but I got to be honest, that just never factors into my decision making as to when I'm going to buy something. Like even, you know, we just had uh, Black Friday a few weeks ago and Cyber Monday, and I, I didn't even pay any attention. I probably bought stuff on the Tuesday after Cyber Monday, not even thinking. <laughs> you mean you didn't just use it for, for giving Tuesday is what you're saying. All right. Well, you're grouch, you're grinch, you're grouch. And, um, you know, I'm sorry about that, gang. This is, he is Mark Talercio. He is the executive producer. He's also a certified financial planner. I am Jill Schlesinger. I'm the CBS News business analyst. And I too am a certified financial planner. And uh, we are here to try to help you make better financial decisions. We really don't know where the deals are. <laughs> I, I used to do all these segments where people would be like, where should I look for deals? And, you know, I would do the same thing that everyone else does, like scour the Internet, do some searches, find like just coalesce the information at the end of the day. I don't know if it's really useful. I mean, there are a lot of good websites to do it, but I, I agree with you, Mark. I cannot possibly shop that way. I do think it's good. If you know the price of things going into the season, if you kind of know what things should cost, but sometimes you can't possibly tell. There was this big article recently about how if you pay $9.99 for something, you're usually getting ripped off. Like you're better off paying $11 because it's probably like actually is a deeper sale. There's all this pricing information and a lot of the research shows that, you know, we are human beings. We think we're getting a deal. Maybe you're not. So the only way you know you're getting a deal is actually to do some research. So That's my two cents. Do a little research. You might be better off this week. All right. You're on your own. Okay. Today, we are helping people make different kinds of financial decisions, not shopping decisions, but better generalized decisions to help you get where you want to go. Today, we are joined by Christopher from the Bay Area. Hi, Christopher. What can we do for you today? Um, I wanted to get a trajectory, basically an assessment of how I'm doing financially and just get a sense of how secure I am at 24 years old. You're 24 and you're already worried about it? Good for you. So tell us what's going on in your life. Do you have a job? I do. I graduated from San Jose State in 2020 and I've had a job for Mm -hmm. the past two years, but multiple different jobs. Did you graduate in 2020 with debt? No, I did not, thankfully. Good. How much money do you make right now? 91,000, not including reimbursements or um, bonuses. What do you think all in you'll make in the year 2022? I hope to make um, around 96. And are you using a retirement plan at work? Uh, Not yet. Um, Since I started the job back in October, uh, the retirement plan doesn't kick in until the first two months. And the 401k Mm -hmm. or retirement plan um, is set up to for the employer to match 50% up to 4% of the salary. And so you think, you know, when you start, you'll put in more than 4% or just up to the match? I think just up to the match. And then what else are you doing to save? Investment accounts. Mm, yeah. Or just like in general, like you don't have the, re- so you did you have a retirement account contribution earlier in the year with a different employer? No, not a 401k, but I do have a Roth IRA. How much is in there? 24. Great. And then all, you said also a brokerage? Actually multiple brokerages which I need to fix. How many multiples? Um, One, two, three, four, five. Why do you have five different accounts? Two TD Ameritrades. I think I went through a stint of trying to day trade when I first started investing, quote unquote. 
Then I have a Robin Hood. Then I have a Wealthfront. And then an M1 to just yep. consistently um, deposit money into the brokerage. The two TDAs, what are they? Like what's in um, each? Some private and some index funds. Mostly private. Uh, what do you mean private? Individual companies. Oh, you mean you have individual, individual stocks. stocks. Yeah. Okay. And in those two TD Ameritrade accounts, what's the total of the two of them? Uh, 46. Wow. And how much is in the Robinhood? 34. This dude's like a saving machine. What's in the wealth front? Seven. Seven. And you said one other account. What was the other account? M1 Finance, um, and that's six. Okay, here's my question to you. Which of these platforms is the easiest for you to use? Like, what do you like the best? Easy to use, efficient. What's the best? Robinhood. In the Robinhood account, are you doing individual securities, fractional shares, index funds? What's in there? Uh, fractional shares of individual securities, as well as I'm trying to build up my portfolio of um, S&P 500 index. Can I convince you to just pick one place and do your business there? I, I think so, because I, okay. I was scatterbrained. I don't know why you're doing the fractional share things. It's it's like, it's such a pain in the ass. Just why don't you just buy, like, if we just put all of this money together, right? Oh, you have $106,000. You have how much, and you have 24 in the a Roth. Tell me, how's the Roth invested? Blue chip companies and index funds. What is with these individual stocks? It's a bad habit. I'll say, how about... You have $106,000 in brokerage accounts. You have $24,000 in a Roth. The first thing I would say is any individual securities, just do it in the Roth. Stop messing around because if you have big gains in these in these other accounts, you're going to have mm-hmm. tax liability yep. and you don't need that. So what I would do is I would be like kind of boring in your brokerage account and really limit the amount of churn that you have. Stop trading in these accounts. Where's the Roth held? Um, Fidelity, which I really like. Why not move everything to Fidelity? Um, TD Ameritrade had a trading platform, Thinkorswim. And then Robinhood yeah, was easy because I could just pull up on my phone and face IDs to see my portfolio. You know what? By the way, that's what I want to make it harder. I want there to be more friction between mm-hmm. you and your investing. You know how everyone says it's better to have frictionless investing? Not for you. Can you tell me where you stand on a tax basis with these accounts? For example, in the TD Ameritrade accounts, are you net net ahead or behind your cost basis and valuation? Do you have a tax loss to harvest anywhere? I do. Um, I think I harvested losses last year, but so far I haven't sold anything this year. You can do this in, in a very methodical way. But again, it's so much harder to do it when you have four different accounts. If everything were in one account, you could look and say, oh, look, I have a gain here, I have a loss here. Let me get rid of both of those things and start over. Boom. Just like that. I think you have to consolidate these counts and you got to figure out a place to do it. I would do everything at Fidelity. What's your living situation in terms of your, your rent? Like you make good money for 24 years old. So what's your cash flow looking like? I mean, forget the day trade and stuff. You should be increasing your 401k when you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, so currently I live with my parents, but I pay about 500 a month, which is just, you know, it's change um, in the Bay Area. So I'm I'm grateful for that. Uh, miscellaneous spending without investments is about twelve hundred a month, and then with mm-hmm. with investments is about two thousand, so eight hundred dollars a month invested every month. And is the the new plan, the new four hundred one k that you're going to have access to, Christopher? Is there a Roth option in that? I don't believe so. No. All right, Mark, give him his marching orders. I want you to I want you to set set Christopher straight. Yeah, even if there is no Roth option, I, I would still take advantage of the workplace retirement plan. I mean, you can def based on your cash flow and your expenses. There's no reason why you can't max that out, and that's still going to leave you with a lot of extra cash flow each month if you want to start, you know, just building up a brokerage account. But I, I would not be using individual stocks, like you said. You want to start building up the S and P 500. That's fine. I would just throw all of your excess cash flow into a brokerage account into the S&P 500. And like Jill said, I, I also would probably use Fidelity or, or TD. Do you think you're a great trader? I feel like you now have, um, you know, 2020, well, I, I presume you started this earlier, but let's say you have three years of experience. How do you think you're doing? Oh, horrible trader. Horrible trader. Okay, then stop this nonsense. What, what can we replace that habit with? Index fund investing on a consistent basis. You're going to want some. You want to scratch that itch. So if you do want to, just here's the here's the um, here is your guardrail of your total invested assets. You have 106 thousand in brokerage. You have 24 thousand that is in your Roth. I'm not even going to consider. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about the the new 401k yet. Right. 
And I want you to think, okay, if I have $130,000, I can have like, let's say 10 grand that I'm going to play with. That's just your fun money account. It can be in the Roth. Okay. You can trade your to your heart's desire. As soon as you start cranking and making a ton of money, then you're going to force yourself to whatever 10% of your total invested assets is. Let's say you measure this once a year. Let's say next year, all of a sudden you're like, wow, Jill, I was, I killed it. Uh, I have a total invested $200,000. My stock position is worth 30 grand. And then I'm going to force you at that moment to sell $10,000 of that stock position to bring you back to t- just keeping that fun money account to 10% of your invested assets. That is going to require a lot of discipline. You <laughs> betcha. Or you can just be like, you know, why am I driving myself crazy? I'm done. Also, when are you going to move out? Because, you know, you're going to need some of this cash flow at some point. Do you have a savings account? I do. And that is about 10000 When do you think you're going to move out? Um, I wanted to get a rental property before I moved out, whether that be like a duplex or a triplex and then possibly house hack that property. How are you going to do that with interest rates, right? Yeah. um, My sister and my dad are still um, working. So I was hoping to team up with them and see what I could do. I think the house hacking idea is great when interest rates are low, but they are not. So, you know, when we, once we saw interest rates for mortgages go from, you know, 3% up to the, you know, let's over 7%, maybe back down again, like this is expensive time to be thinking about any sort of investment income because the market is shifting. It's like really very dramatically different for, than it was 18 months ago. So I would actually not think that's a very good idea. If things shift, if all of a sudden, you know, I'm talking to you in two years and you're like, oh my God, mortgage rates are down again and I've got property and my I'm making more money and that's a different thing. But I don't know why you would want to enter the real estate market right now. And also we don't know where your, you know, where your life is going to lead. You're an amazing situation. You earn a lot of money and I, I presume your income is only going to rise. You're young. Things are great. You're putting money in your Roth. You put money in the 401k. If you're building up these non-retirement accounts in general, that may be the basis to do some sort of real estate transaction. But right now, even though I hate saying market timing, but it is a crappy time to buy when we really don't know what the mortgage situation, when it's going to be a relief to get out of such a high interest rate environment. So I'd be very careful about that. You're 24. You've got six figures saved. You're making six figures. Just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, fully fund the 401k, do the brokerage account. By the time you're 40, oh my goodness, forget it. Okay. I don't know if he's buying it. Are we convinced? Do we sound like old broken? We're like, oh, you old farts. You know, are you feeling a little bit lectured to? I feel like we're no, no, it's it's good advice. Um, That's the itch that I can't scratch is the rental property. Forget about the day trading. Forget about the individual stocks. The rental property is the itch I can't scratch. I feel like the rental property is the one that could be really dangerous in a weird way. I mean, at the very at the very least, wait a while and see what happens. I mean, if you could wait one year, we'll know. We'll have a okay. lot more information. I don't know what you do for a living, but sometimes like things reveal themselves with a little bit of time. If you said to me last year, okay, like let me just show you how quickly the world can turn around. Let's pretend it's exactly a year ago. It's the end of 2021 and you have not because you're a great trader, but because all markets are higher. And you say to me, you know, I really want to buy a rental property. The Bay Area is crazy. I found this amazing place. You know, I have this $100,000 in a brokerage account. I want to sell everything. I want to use that as my down payment. And I have a a chance to get a 2.85% 30-year fixed rate mortgage. My my parents and my sister are going to go in with it me with me. Like that's a moment where I actually would be like, okay, it's a it's a pretty big risk, but rates are low. You've made money by mistake in your brokerage accounts, and okay, go for it. You can always build those up. But a year later, I'm giving you totally different advice because mortgage rates are so much higher. Because you're you're coming off of a period of time where you know really it does not make a ton of sense as the real estate market and prices are starting to shift that you don't really know what fair value is in this moment even. Every market 
is actually subject to the reality of market forces. And what we know now is because interest rates are so high, demand is dropping, and there will be a chance for you to buy this rental property. I promise you, there will be a chance. I just think now's not a great time for you. That's that's the reassurance that I wanted. I think that Christopher is in great shape. I really do. You, I think you got in touch with us simply because you knew that this plan that you were pursuing was a little bit awry. So congratulations. Thank you. You're on your way, man. Okay. If you, like Christopher, want to come on the program and start to prevent yourself from scratching itches that you know may not be in your best interest, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click the contact us button. Tell us your story. Click the little box that says you'd be willing to come on the air while you're on the website. Don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter and pre-order my new book. It's called The Great Money Reset. When you pre-order, you will be subscribing, not just to get a fantastic book. You will also be entitled to join us for a webinar in February and you get a free book plate, which is kind of cool too. So check it out. Pre-order the book, The Great Money Reset. It's all on our website. Mark Talerse was the co-host and the executive producer of this program. We are distributed by Paramount Global. We drop our episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Try to do something nice for someone else today. Curiosity, compassion, community. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you on Thursday. Thursday. 